morning to all of you. Uh, myself, Dr. Surya Narayan Dutta, Assistant Professor from College of Fisheries, Guru Angadev Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, Ludhiana. On behalf of College of Fisheries, uh, Guru Angadev Veterinary and Animal Science University, Ludhiana, I heartily welcome Dr. Ramaya N. Sir. Uh, retired Chief Scientist, Department of Biological Oceanography, CSIR National Institute of Oceanography, NIO Goa, on this webinar on advances in oceanography and marine biology, jointly organized by IDP Cell, Gadbashu, and College of Fisheries, Guru Angadde Veterinary and Animal Sciences University. Uh, we are very much thankful, sir, just in, in spite of your busy schedule, you have accepted our invitation. Once again, thank you and welcome you. Uh, I welcome also Dr. Jitender Kumar, Dr. Prabhjit Singh and other faculty members and members of So before starting the presentation, I would like to introduce Dr. Ramanya sir with you. Dr. Ramanya, an eminent oceanographer, pursued his BFSC and MFSC from College of Fisheries, Mangalore, Karnataka, and PhD from University of Jabalpur. Sir has over 35 years professional expertise in the field of marine biology environmental impact assessment and modeling to predict environmental impact on fishery sector. He served in various capacities as chief scientist in CSIR National Institute of Oceanography, NIO Goa, and has participated more than 25 national and international research expeditions. He also served as summer team member to 10th Indian expedition to Antarctica and dynamically involved in formulating various rules and policies associated with sustainable development of marine ecology and marine biology. At present, Dr. Ramaya involved in many R&D activities in marine microbiology and biotechnology also. Apart from his administrative assignments, he also guided 59 postgraduate students and published more than 200 research papers in different journals of national and international reputes. Dr. Ramaya also involved in finalizing various schemes and policies for the sustainable development of marine fisheries in the country. So once again, I welcome you, sir, and also inviting you for presentation. For a very warm introduction, I'm very pleased and happy. Uh, the best part is that uh, you guys, uh, especially Dr. Jitendra, Prabhjit, in the morning, you welcome me so very heartily. And I'm grateful that uh, I have an opportunity of interacting virtually now. Hopefully in the future, we can have a, uh, an interaction that could be more uh, close to you know, uh, uh, the students. I have always liked to be sharing what I've learned to the student community because I have learned from our teachers similarly. And with this uh, background, what I will do is I'll now screen, share my screen and uh, go ahead with my presentation. Yes, good morning, students. I I hope uh, you are having a very, uh, very cozy weather in Punjab. 
and like in goa we are having a little warm time this year it is not cool so far excepting a couple of days now and uh, i thank uh, jitendra and dr datta and prabjit for uh, really kenyami is that clear madam can you hear me you tell me yes or no uh, yes. yes sir please go yes. ahead please go ahead sir. okay thank you yeah you see if there is a, a any interruption please let me know uh, jitendra you can uh, say hold on by showing yeah, the hand please. yeah please. Sir, yes, that will be oh, okay, easier sir. for okay. yeah. yeah easy to follow so uh, yeah i was uh, just thanking you people and then uh, i would like to come to the topic today uh, you dr jitendra asked me to give a talk on an introduction to oceanography and marine biology so and also in the seminar uh, the advance is a very large term so therefore what i you know uh, in oceanography is as vast as the ocean itself it covers 71% of the land mass therefore what i'll do in the next 45 minutes or so would be an introduction and a, a few overviews in which the students of oceanography uh, which they want to as fisheries graduates pursue in future uh, my presentation outline will involve uh, a general introduction a brief description on oceanography i'll spend about 5 to 8 minutes on uh, why oceanography and what it can do to the people and uh, especially the fisheries graduates why they should know about the oceans is my emphasis and then uh, what are the major areas of uh, research in ocean aspects of marine biology and because you are all fisheries graduates there should be a linkage to this vast water body through understanding the fish stock and how they are sustaining our economies so that is my overall uh, uh, presentation outline i hope all of you can see this uh, slide and uh, i have given a very uh, strange title for this uh, uh, aspect the odds and oz of planet planet question mark ocean so why planet why are the supposing that our uh, ancestors knew that uh, the water body is much larger than the earth portion of it maybe they would have called it planet sagar for example in india and our planet aqua some such name so therefore the water that is encompassing 71% of the earth's surface is very 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 massive um if you look at the left side of your uh, uh, slide here that is the vertical profiling of the ocean from the very top surface layer to the deepest portion which is about 11022 meters if you look at it the sun is only for a very short depth of something like 200 meters and there is a diffused light to up to 1000 meters and previous people thought that uh, the life below no light zone there is nothing called life that is what was called the a photic and no life zone but uh, people have now found out that even at the 11022 meters there is life kicking and fantastic which we have not really understood uh, its metabolism physiology so all of us eat salt in, a, in in our daily meals i don't want to take more time because it's going to be a, a big thing to talk about it let me tell you this clearly at a 5 gram average consumption per person per day in india we require something like 3000 tons of salt every day which means salt is a big business in the country uh, 
See, Russian Quest did not uh, nutrition problem from the land, wanted to go settle more near the coast. Therefore, we have more uh, density of population near the coast than what is that, uh, how do I get uh, this screen? Manish, can you please come here quickly and then uh, uh, make my screen that I can see? Okay, okay, yeah. Very good. Yes, sir. Thank yes, you. Sir. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. See, uh, the people had a huge quest uh, from uh, time immemorial, and then actually systematic oceanography started sometime in the 17th century. And one of the famous challenger expedition, the British were ruling India at that time, and uh, they there was oh, okay. Uh, can you hear now? Yeah. They organized the thing on the left side, the top corner, you see a ship which was uh, propelled using the uh, sailors and also some kind of a coal-based uh, motor. And they, they could uh, go around the entire world oceans. You can see that red line in the bottom thing. They started from England, took this. Can you see my arrow moving, Jitendra? Yeah, yes, sir. It's coming, sir. Yeah. So they went around and then came to this thing. Kindly note that uh, when they came back after four years uh, after stopping here and there, they did not cover much of the Indian Ocean region. But then the first time we came to understand the chemical composition of seawater, distribution of life forms at all depths. These are the people who said that life is there even at uh, the deepest depths. And the studies on coastal and ocean currents were understood. The water is not a stable body. It, uh, currents are responsible for moving uh, a lot of things, uh, the fish larvae included. When you are uh, uh, third year or fourth year graduate students want to study oceanography, they will be saying that the larval distribution happens through the help of uh, ocean currents. And then there was also the geologists who understood. There were six, six scientists worked very hard uh, to collect a lot of data uh, from uh, this. In fact, uh, Challenger expedition reports were in more than 50 big volumes. Same thing happened with Indian Ocean expedition, which I'll not touch. Uh, the modern oceanography started somewhere in the 1900s. And uh, NAO, the premier institution in the country, was born in the year 1966. And uh, in the year 2016, we completed 50 years. And uh, in a few slides next, I will be talking about uh, some of the most important contribution uh, our institution has done. For those of you students, I want to tell you that oceanography is a great career and fisheries science is the most welcome. And let me tell you here that I was a fisheries graduate. I graduated my master's and joined the biological oceanography. And from then on, I must, uh, honestly tell that I've enjoyed working uh, in this great organization. And uh, then modern oceanography is not only um, uh, comfortable, but it's a very expensive science. Supposing that, uh, I don't know how much uh, the first year, second year students have uh, learned about uh, sampling in the ocean and or in the lakes. If you are going into the lake, you will find that you have to hire a boat take a water sampler and collect it from different depth. And one day boat hire charges is going to be 10 to 12,000 rupees. And therefore, if you took uh, 10 liter water, every liter of water is 1,000 rupees. Whereas a ship on the bottom uh, right corner is our own uh, India mm -hmm. ship. Uh, if we go to 2,000 meters and collect a water sample, of just we can collect about two to three liters from there. Every one liter water will cost you already 100,000 rupees. So therefore, oceanography is a costly science. Therefore, when you do a, 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 a money investment, you should get good returns. These days, the satellite uh, have come to help uh, by collecting a lot of surface ocean data, which uh, the biologists also benefit from. I can answer your questions if you have something like that. 
the marine habitats are too many. In fact, from your very coastline where people are standing on the left corner here, even before the coastline, you have these, uh, some mangroves and uh, vegetation that is growing. If you grow a little shallower, you get the coral reefs. You go a little deeper, you have uh, a lot of uh, old coral reefs. And if you go very deep, you have uh, the blue dark water and there are some fishes. But in the deepest, uh, I, what is called sea, for, sea floor spreading places, there are the high temperature uh, sulfides gush to the surface. There is also varieties of different life. We call them hydrothermal vents and hydrothermal organisms. See, as uh, commoners, we will never uh, appreciate the vastness of the ocean. Of the of the uh, seventy one percent of the surface accounts for three hundred and sixty five million square kilometers of the area. The waters are up to eleven kilometer deep. The ocean is the Earth's largest ecosystem, and it contains bacteria to whales. So therefore, there is a variety of life, and then I'll be introducing a few of them in my next slides. And it offers many, many benefits. Our, uh, you, whatever water, uh, rainwater you receive in Punjab as uh, uh, the rainwater is because of the uh, surface evaporation on the sea and uh, winds moving into the ocean, in the, onto the land, and only a part of the rain is received. All the green that we get from our uh, uh, land is thanks to the water that is the seawater evaporated and drained into onto the land. So therefore, it's our heritage. We should never lose it for any reason. We should, therefore, we should not be polluting it. We should take care of this ecosystem, which is the largest on the surface of the earth, and continue to benefit from it for times to come. This is, this is the picture of Indian Ocean. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is the picture of the Indian Ocean. Uh, you can see in the center, I have put uh, varieties of pictures to make you understand. Indian Ocean is uh, the very smallest of the three large oceans. The Pacific, the largest, the Atlantic, next large, the, uh, and, uh, the Indian Ocean, the smaller, 70 million square kilometers in area, and Antarctic and Arctic are marginal seas, in fact. So the, the, it has, the, unlike the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, which are open to both poles, the Indian Ocean is landlocked in the north. There is no connection to the pole, North Pole, whereas it has the touch to the, uh, the Antarctic. And that's how we Indians can go to Antarctica more easily uh, by the ships. Although now we have program in the Arctic. Uh, the India is one of the leading uh, oceanography uh, researchers in the world, we have contributed significantly. If you, you know, although oceanography is only 50 years old in this uh, part of the world, we are ranked the number seven in the world. If you, for those of you students interested, you go to libraries and see there are institutions which have completed close to 175 years in the US, Canada, Japan, and also Europe. Whereas with this 50 years and the churning of the Indian Ocean, like the Samudra Manthan, we have, we have we are ranked more than seventh in the World Committee of Oceanographers. That's a great news. And then you can also know that the Indian monsoon is driven by the operation, as I explained, and many, many major rivers drain into it. On the West Coast, you are all the Punjab rays joining the Sindh, uh, Indus will get into the Arabian Sea, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, Kaveri uh, will join into the Bay of Bengal on the right side of your screen. So the bottom flasher is the chlorophyll concentration. As biologists, we should be interested what is the synoptic view of the chlorophyll that is present. And based on thousands of uh, spots that you see uh, when the screen is uh, stationary, that uh, the samples have come from there and the chlorophyll is analyzed and put to understand the productivity of the ocean. 
the greener portions sometimes you see on the screen are highly productive just to remember that the blue water that you see in the bottom portion is the, the biological desert not much production happens and on the top right side you see the monsoon cloud covering the meteorologists have a huge say in predicting the rains that happen across the uh, indian con subcontinent and uh, i think we have completed the rains from the arabian sea side sometimes uh, up to january we will be getting some rains coming from the bay of bengal side that's why india is blessed with two monsoons and we should therefore be thankful to the ocean that is surrounding us um in the next uh, slide you see the csr uh, nio uh, is the premier institution doing the oceanographic research in this country there are many other uh, in universities and then also a lot of uh, other institutions and the ministry of earth sciences have come and therefore you guys uh, students if you are looking at a career in aquatic biology all these institutions are useful for you so keep your mind open punjab is a great place because you have lot of water there you can grow lot of fish but also you can venture into seeing the sea and being a career oceanographers if you so want and we have three other centers other than goa that is one in mumbai very modern building and we have built a circular building in kochi and we have in visakhapatnam in the east coast another center a lot of lot of new research is coming from these areas and we have two currently two wonderful ships on which our scientists go and collect a lot of data on physics chemistry biology geology geophysics uh, of the oceans and then uh, these the, these things are important for example you see the sindhu sadhana is the most modern ship built in 2013 uh, can take about uh, uh, 29 scientists and can be on the uh, on the on the sea for 45 days that is called the endurance and the length overall is 80 meters and the speed of about 26 kilometers in hour which means that you can be on the water 26 kilometers is a big speed not like punjab roads uh, which can go up to 150 it's uh, it, the sea sea is uh, rough and then uh, to cross the Uh, force of the ocean is not easy therefore getting 26 uh, miles is a good good event the there are many research areas that are of interest i will not read them because of the want of time and also the technical hitch has created uh, confusion there are ocean processes that we understand through the understanding of the circulation in the northern indian ocean the long term variability of sea level sea level is important i don't know how many of you have uh, heard of dwarka in uh, punjab i mean i'm sorry gujarat uh, the sea level has fluctuated several times in the last 5000 years and people have to understand what uh, is the sea level link that can happen the sea level rise these days is connected to global warming when the sea ice in the uh, polar regions melt and then because they become water because the surface is like this the sea level will rise a 1 meter rise of uh, sea level will sink half of panjim some of you if you have seen uh, goa you will know that uh, it's a beautiful place but then if the sea level rises it is a bad thing nio is interested in understanding how much is the sea level that is rising and what kind of uh, problems that can be created because of that in uh, both east and west coast we understand the ocean environment we study the coastal processes through understanding the wind speeds wave heights current direction and uh, strength the low tide high tide problems their influence on coastal biology geomorphology coastal erosion is a big issue a 1 km long coast if it is uh, every day a 1 million ton of uh, sediment is uh, removed you are going to have uh, in 10 days 3 to 4 km uh, uh, wipe out of the coastal belt which is very dangerous for the land people inside therefore 
people understand the coastal dynamics and advise how to protect and how to kind of uh, uh, repair the coastal erosion. We as biologists have been doing a lot of work and there is also the, though because you are going to have a lot of biology background, there is in marine biology, you can understand the taxonomy, you can come to do biotechnology. There are lots of enzymes, the fish food uh, organisms, all of this can be understood by studying oceanography. And then uh, we have uh, a lot of pollution problem. You guys may be sitting in Punjab, some of the waste produced finally reach the ocean. Uh, therefore, you please don't pollute there so that our waters are clean. I'm not telling only to you, I'm also telling the people all around the globe that I have met not to pollute anywhere so that the pollution is not a problem for a long time. Your grandchildren will suffer the mer mercury poison that we may do today. Therefore, be careful. And we also have a lot of research on marine minerals, uh, and uh, then we are looking at the energy from sea. In the bottom uh, right uh, bottom corner, you see a white and uh, brownish covered uh, uh, you know, solid matter. It's a core of what we call gas hydrate. The gas hydrate, a one cubic meter of gas hydrate contains 165 cubic meters of liquefied natural gas that we use in cooking gas. And also you can convert that into fuels. So therefore, the NIO has found reservoirs of gas hydrates in the ocean, which can be the future prospect for energy alternative. And uh, in the middle of the picture slide, you see here is polymetallic nodules. We find them at the depth of about 5,000 meters. And from our scientists in geological oceanography were the first in the country to pick up the manganese nodule and uh, today, uh, India is owning about 75,000 square kilometers of area. It's exclusive property right for us to go and harvest all these uh, polymetallic nodules, which are rich in manganese, iron, copper, cobalt, and nickel. And these are some of them are not available on the earth, in particular cobalt, which is a strategically important uh, metal. We can benefit from uh, uh, harnessing this. With, mind you guys, it's extremely costly affair. Therefore, we have to be looking for alternates. And if you don't find any, in order to have security of the country, if we have to use it uh, to protect us, we may have to do the mining in the future. And then on the top uh, portion in this picture, I want to tell you, it's a sand in a black color. It's called ilmenite. Ilmenite contains thorium, which is a nuclear uh, uh, you know, material which can be used for producing your nuclear, nuclear fuels. So therefore, NIO is contributing, not only NIO, oceanographic research world over is interested in contributing to the betterment of the mankind, not only in terms of life uh, and uh, fisheries, but also in terms of mineral and chemical resources. I told you the best example every day we eat in this part of the world. I don't know in Punjab if you eat uh, the Himalayan rock salt, but we in Goa consume the sea salt, which is a 3,000 ton consumer every uh, day in the country. You can imagine that. And also we have the geophysics. The earthquake uh, uh, happening in the oceans are studied by our geophysicists. We also develop some of the instruments uh, useful in uh, uh, weather station, automatic weather station to be put on the, on the, on the sea and people can monitor that. Now I turn my attention uh, on marine biology, marine ecology, and biological oceanography. See, you as uh, the fisheries graduates, you should know the, what is aquatic biology, what is aquatic ecology, and what is aquatic ecological process. So this will clearly tell you how good you can be in terms of distinguishing when a person says aquatic biology versus an aquatic ecology, similarly aquatic ecological processes. So look at the left side of your, the screen that is displayed. Marine biology is uh, occupied in studying the organisms in the ocean and other marine or brackish water bodies. Brackish is low saline estuarine waters. 
I'm not defining any of those terms because of the lack of time. If you want me to explain, call me in the, uh, in the question answer time. The marine biology encompasses taxonomy of the organisms at their classification and then their evaluation of uh, their anatomy and physiology and biochemistry. And also the organisms uh, that range from uh, bacteria to the whales are the part of the biological understanding. Whereas ecology is the understanding of the, how these organisms interact with each other and also with their environment. Same as what is aquatic ecology, what you learn in your uh, you know, general course. And then uh, there are, as you saw in the first slide, there is such a lot of difference in the depth. Even the ocean is, uh, the near coast ocean is called uh, uh, near shore, Offshore uh, are the little faraway places called uh, uh, pelagic or ocean offshore. And then uh, if you go vertically, there is pelagic and then mesopelagic, yeah. and then go down to deep, abyssal, and then hadal. Like this, there are classification of the very water column itself. And there is also the many organisms that live attached to or associated with bottom. They, we call them benthos. So they are also there. And that is the ecology of these organisms interaction with their ecosystem and with that of the, uh, them within their community. For example, for their own reproduction, uh, their own uh, chasing away the enemies that are coming to eat, their own food, they have to chase the food to eat. In ocean, the philosophy is the one eats the other, the other eats the other. That is how the life continues. That is what is also called the food chain in a simple way. There are uh, ecological habits like coral reefs, kelp uh, forests. Kelp is a seaweed grown into meters of length and it's not uh, uh, much in this part of the world, but in Gujarat, we do have kelp forests. Sea grasses are there, which are good food for, uh, there is an animal called sea cow or the dugong which feeds on it. And then there are also sea mounts in the deep ocean. They're like uh, the Himalaya underwater. You can imagine that kind of a subsurface, uh, uh, different features are there. Thermal vents, the hydrothermal vent I showed you one. There are uh, small tide pools, which can also be ecologically interesting. And people are also studying these things a great deal because going out into the ocean, even for five meters, you need a boat, therefore, it's a costly experiment. They people most of the time study what are called coastal uh, ecosystem studies. The biological oceanography is uh, looking at the processes that are influencing the biology. The biophysics, chemistry influence very various. For example, if the water is very cold, you can't have the, uh, the fish that is living in uh, warm water there. The physical temperature inhibits that. Uh, but the organisms do adapt and live. There are bacteria which are living in the deep depth there, and they are going to be working with the cold water, but very slowly. That is what is called adaptation, and that biological pro oceanography understands that. Uh, similarly, there are the environment specialization basis. Our all this production and other things are based on this. Now, this is a slide that I want you to think when you go home. Human is always giving something or the other to the ocean and is always taking something or the other from the ocean. What he gives is pollution and wastes and sometimes some good nu nutrient because uh, after all, uh, not everything is a pollutant. This sewage pollution if it is in a small quantity, it is going to help the nutrient uh, enrichment in the ocean. That's the give is pollution mostly. Take is fish, salt, rainwater, you name it. And also he uses it for tra transoceanic shipping. The ships tra travels across the ocean. So therefore there is so much. And therefore you must have the socioeconomic consideration, the governance aspect of it. How do you protect uh, the ecosystem from the pollution and uh, keep it healthy? How do you monitor uh, the productivity of the ocean? Is all part of uh, the human endeavor. It should be that way. But then the food chains and food webs are the words that are normally used in your uh, ecosystem uh, studies. 
The food chain is the one that the linearly a, a phytoplankton is e e eaten by a zooplankton and the zooplankton is eaten by a small fish and a small fish is eaten by a medium sized fish and medium sized fishes are eaten again by a large sized fish is a linear food chain. Whereas there are some jellyfish which, which are zooplankton, but they can also engulf uh, some small sized fishes. That, that cuts complication. That is why it's called food web. I will not give the more than that detail for this. And uh, this is the, the philosophy that one should understand. It applies even to the aquatic ecology. Therefore, I put it here. Life at sea can require only the solar uh, insulation from inside. All other things, it can manufacture and work by itself. It doesn't need anything more. So you can see the phytoplankton can do even nitrogen fixation. And the chlorophyll will help in uh, photo adaptation and then photosynthesis. And then if they are dead, uh, the bacteria work on it and release the nutrients necessary for it to again regrow. This phytoplankton, when eaten by the zooplankton, and then there's, that is called the gra grazing uh, uh, food path in which the zooplankton are again defecating and the defecation is decomposed by bacteria, most of it. And that is again brought back into a cycle in the top layer. What is that MLD you see here is the mixed layer depth. That is uh, where most of the productivity of the ocean happens. And uh, this is very abundantly a, an important uh, feature. And the life at sea is abundant is present everywhere, very diverse. It's much more diverse than what we see on the land. Self-sustaining, like I said, all you need is sunlight. The rest of it, they can, uh, the life in the ocean can manage by itself. It can also be a great climate controller. Why is a great climate controller? For example, when photosynthesis happens, the carbon dioxide is fixed by the chlorophyll uh, processing phytoplankton. This phytoplankton taking the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, it is called the drawdown of the atmosphere. And therefore, all our uh, uh, pollution through carbon dioxide, that is increasing of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, to a large extent, the ocean absorbs that carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. And when the phytoplankton uh, produce so much, part of it is eaten and part of it is uh, remineralized. Most of it is formed as detritus and sinks into the deep portion of the ocean, which will not be very quickly available back to recirculation or recycling. Therefore, the part that is held up, even if it is in small quantity, because the ocean surface being so much, is so important in controlling the climate. Imagine that we have been using so many vehicles without the help from the sea. By now, the carbon dioxide, I don't know how many of you know, currently it's already 420 ppm. By now, it would be in the last 50 years onwards, it would have crossed easily 600 ppm, which is very bad. When the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is high, the warming is so high and you are very uncomfortable. You age fast, you die soon. That is what happens if you don't have the ocean help. And the life forms are autotrophic, like phytoplankton, heterotrophic, like bacteria and whales. The microscopic phytoplankton to bacteria to many zooplankton are microscopic. And megaloscopic is large size from your fishes. I don't know if you've eaten mackerel from the ocean. Tuna, you may have heard. And you will learn more of the third year and second year and first year students you may learn later on. But uh, there are more than 4,000 different species of fish which will be caught and uh, not all of them. Some are caught and some are eaten in this part of the world. And whales are also present there. The new molecules uh, are possible from the biological system in the ocean. Therefore, they can be new age biotech spinners, and what more else? You have to be keeping on looking for that. And uh, of course, this is a very um, repeated slide. I will not uh, go back to that. Just to give you one small number, in 2019, last year, 
the global income from the ocean biology was 30 trillion tons. India is 3 trillion ton economy. US is 16 trillion ton economy. Chinese are about 12, Japanese about eight, yeah, other people. See, the ocean economy equals to all these five countries name I took. So that is the value of ocean uh, biology uh, in the thing. But the marine bacteria, marine biota are very important for several reasons. They are uh, living in the harsh conditions. They are very adaptable. And then they can also do a lot of, uh, uh, you know, metal re recyclability. Therefore, they're useful in bioremediation and environmentally safe. You don't, you can use them for uh, cleaning uh, uh, the molasses waste in Punjab refineries using the bacteria from the coasts, fungus from the coast, the microalgae from the coast. So therefore, they're, uh, because they're able to tolerate salt, they're very good uh, bioremediators and biotechnology help. And then there is, whether you like it or not, human being may not have an ecological role, it's the advantages, but even the tiniest bacteria to the largest whale, they have a one or the other important help they do to the ocean. Say, for example, bacteria decompose uh, uh, the uh, organic uh, matter and they give back the nutrients. The whales, which eat about uh, one ton fish every day, can uh, digest so much food and when their defecated matter comes into the ocean, that's a good nutrient for uh, the phytoplankton to grow. And also for your information, they degas so much and they contain methane in their uh, belly when it is all uh, only the krill and other things they eat. Therefore, they're very interesting creature even to find out what is their gas concentration in the thing. So in the next four or five slides, what I'll do is I'll tell the important roles of uh, the, uh, the bacteria, the phytoplankton, the microzooplankton, the zooplankton uh, in the ocean uh, system. I don't know if you have any microbiology background. Yeah, our normal uh, 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 fresh water, if you take from the sea in the, in the, in the you know, you go to bass or uh, uh, satellite uh, river and you pick up uh, one milliliter water and count it the bacteria, they may not be more than 10,000 bacterial cells. Whereas if you come into the ocean, even in the very coastal water, you take one ml seawater and you count, there will be one million bacterial cells. So therefore, if you counted all the bacteria in the entire water column of the world oceans, you have 10 raised to 30 million, 30, 10 raised to 30 cells, which is 10 million trillion trillion, which is a big number. Actually, uh, I don't know how many of you are used to calling uh, crore. One crore is 10 raised to eight uh, units. Uh, 10 crores is, uh, uh, is that correct, Manish? 10 raised to eight is seven. Ten, 10 raised to seven is a crore. 10 raised to, in, uh, in uh, English, billion, it's 10 raised to nine is a billion. 10 raised to uh, 12 is a trillion. The Indian economy we are talking is ending at 10 raised to 12 uh, rupees. You see, or uh, dollars, I'm sorry, dollars. It may be about uh, 10 raised to 14 uh, rupees. So Bill Gates, or somebody like that, we call them the richest man on earth and this, that. Their, uh, their dollars hand at 10 raised to 10. Look at this bacteria. The power of exponential power you must appreciate. That is such a big thing. And then bacteria, this is a photograph I'm showing from a one microscopic field. We have very special stains to do this job. And when you put under the microscope, each rod-shaped bacteria is this. In, in this one microscopic field view, you have already 300 bacterial cells. So you can compare, therefore, when I say one, this has come from a part of a milliliter. Therefore, you can imagine when I say 10 raised to 30 cells are there in the world ocean, you must believe. And then if you spread thin, one microliter, one micrometer thin, uh, one liter uh, seawater, 
you have 70% of that uh, surface area occupied by bacteria alone. The rest of the veil, wall, everything you want to imagine is only occupying about 30% of the rest of the space. The bacteria are so important in the, uh, in the, in the water column. They are present all over from the surface microlayer to the deep and they can be very diverse. We do not know what is the total number of different species of bacteria existing in the seawater even today. Although modern molecular biology talks a great deal. They call the bags of enzymes. You name an enzyme which is important in catabolic reaction, they are present in there. And uh, all the, uh, you know, if you take about 10,000 different species of bacteria, you look for the enzymes, one or the other species will contain uh, the special enzyme that is useful for any application in uh, curing diseases, in curing uh, pollution, in, uh, in increasing the industrial production, fermentation, etc. <clears throat> they can uh, utilize a huge quantity of different types of uh, uh, nutrition. They can even uh, <clears throat> work on the metal ion and derive energy. They're called chemolithotrophs. And then they have, in the seawater, there is not much food available all the time. Therefore, they have to be hungry for even a year. And after that, if something is coming, they very quickly uh, put the enzymes out into the water by sensing what, what enzyme to put out. And they collect that uh, material from outside. <coughs> and uh, then digest that inside for some kind of growth later on. And then they can assimilate dissolved organic matter, which is the most important quality, unlike uh, 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 many other uh, forms of uh, life, they become very important in sustaining life. And then they can also, uh, you know, there is called a labile dissolved organic carbon that is made into resistant dissolved organic carbon which helps in climate control. I can explain later. Phytoplankton, you see on the right bottom corner of the varieties of shapes from the ocean, there are diatoms, there are dinoflagellates, there are silicoflagellates, there are radiolarians, different types. And they are the on the pyramid of food chain, they're at the bottom of the food chain. And the zooplankton feed on them and the, the small fish on them the bigger fish and the small fish, and be finally predators eat this. And they're very important. You know, uh, I think uh, you will understand later on what a billion ton of carbon means. In, uh, in the total uh, uh, Earth's uh, surface, uh, something like 70 billion tons of carbon is fixed and modulated every year of which 40 billion tons is uh, modulated by uh, phytoplankton, the, which means they do the phytosynthetic uh, activity much more than the land plants and trees and also the mangroves. So therefore, the phytoplankton are so important. They are the food for zooplankton, as I said. They indicate water masses and currents and fisheries. In the why fisheries, you know, there is one uh, uh, species called Fragilaria oceanica. Uh, when the fragile area is a high number in, uh, in our coastal waters, you can expect that the sardines are coming. So that way they are indicators of uh, some big fish. And then uh, big fisheries, they contribute to sinking of organic matter and they have varieties of application. And uh, the satellite oceanographers have come very helpful because we cannot go and measure every inch of the ocean the synaptic view has been helpful in understanding the chlorophyll concentration and distribution, month-wise, day-wise, hour-wise, and people collect everything and pull them together and give you a synaptic view for years on. This is a running uh, slide, which will tell you for the last about uh, 1996 to 2013, how the chlorophyll month on month behaved can be uh, run and then understood. This kind of uh, data collection is helpful in predicting the future fishery. That is why this uh, satellite oceanography, especially for biological oceanographers, has come very handy. And you can also calculate uh, what is the chlorophyll variability in the uh, in the in the in the surface by you know, for example, the yellow boxed uh, 
Northeast Arabian Sea region, uh, the variability is so much. In some, this is the average in the middle, dark and the white spot thing. And uh, that's how you understand how the chlorophyll behaved. And therefore, you can, using this data, because we know that for every 100 grams of uh, uh, chlorophyll produced, there is 10 grams zooplankton possible. For every 10 grams zooplankton produced, there's one gram fish coming. Therefore, by knowing what is the chlorophyll concentration in this uh, thing, you can roughly estimate what is the fish potential in the given region. And these are different uh, sized uh, phytoplankton. If you have a one, uh, what is called the flow cam microscope, you can really measure the small minutest spaces and understand how uh, in the pre-monsoon, the same species of phytoplankton was looking, which size was small. And in the monsoon, when there is high nutrient, the same thing looks so big. So therefore, this is also, this uh, information can be used in understanding when uh, the climate change happens, the phytoplankton don't get a lot of nutrition. Therefore, they will be having small size. When there is small size, there will not be enough food for the fish that is feeding on. Therefore, there can be impact on fisheries. That is how we can understand that. And there are zooplankton, which will be uh, plenty varieties. 36,000 different species of zooplankton are there. They are distributed widely. And they are the primary link uh, to the uh, fishes from the phytoplankton and therefore they, they are also very important. As I said, there are uh, 36,000 species. I hope all of you students learn this zooplankton uh, biology and things like that. What is finally yeah. take home message in this is that zooplankton are the most important link for transferring the energy from the primary level to the fish level, that is tertiary level. The human beings catch the second, the small size fish and eat, and the big size fish and eat. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, human is the only unwise species because they do not know how much to catch. They catch in greed and lose the stock. That is my worry and uh, fear of the future. And we can collect uh, using different things. For example, this is a zooplankton net towed at the surface to collect the surface, uh, this one. This is a zooplankton net which can be sent up to any depth in the ocean. We call it the multiple plankton net and collect uh, the, uh, the, the sample at discrete depth. It has opening and closing mechanism such that you open the uh, net, uh, the first net is opened till 500 meters from 1000 meter to 500 meter. And that is closed at this depth. Therefore you collect the zooplankton from 1,000 to 500 meters. And when you close this net, the second one in series will open and collect the sample from 500 meter to 300 meter. We call it as the bottom of the thermocline. Thermocline is the uh, thing that you must have already understood. And then the third net will collect from uh, the one in the bottom of the thermocline. And the next one is in the thermocline. Next one in the mixed layer. Mixed layer depth is small, but the zooplankton biovolume will be high. You know why? Because there is food for them in the surface. That's why their abundance is also high. Their biomass is also high. So that's how we can understand the, uh, the biomass distribution in the vertical ocean. This is uh, some of the pictures we have taken from the Bay of Bengal. The copepods are the major species in the uh, aquatic ecosystem. They're called the, uh, the grazers of the ocean. Uh, then there are uh, 1,200 different species of these in the Indian Ocean region. And therefore, if you guys are interested in looking at the microscopy and uh, understanding their biology and their beauty, please join oceanography. These are other different forms of zooplankton. And uh, then we have different gadgets to collect the samples. The one in the bottom right most portion is called a grab. The top on the right side is a uh, dredger. And this is a high speed uh, micro uh, plankton tow on the left side of your uh, screen. And these are the trawl nets that we use for catching fish. And uh, this is a scene bag in the center of the bottom uh, is a large fishing uh, per scene, we call it is the one that is used. And like, like this is a cartoon to tell you, 
guys, I did not so far tell that photosynthesis is the mother of all reaction in which the carbon dioxide is fixed in uh, the presence of light and it produces organic molecule plus oxygen. And then the respiration, which is done by all of us heterotrophs, uh, is the one that is converting the organic matter and consuming oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. So this is the reaction which is uh, happening simultaneously. Now, at one place I mentioned that uh, out of the 70 billion tons of carbon fixed by the plants and uh, on the earth and uh, also in the ocean, 40 billion is coming from the phytoplankton. Look at this. Most plants on the land consume their oxygen during the night time, whereas the phytoplankton give out as much as 8% of their what they produce in excess out into the ocean water and then which will again escape into the atmosphere when there are cool conditions coming uh, during some kind of a season like this in, in Punjab. So therefore, be thankful to the phytoplankton which are doing more service to mankind and atmosphere than uh, what we all can. So this is a, a cartoon again drawn. Bacteria are the centric in producing the uh, dead organic matter is converted to inorganic nutrients, which are used by the uh, photosynthetic organism, that is phytoplankton. Then bacteria to phytoplankton, to zooplankton, to nectar. Nectar is the free swimming form of uh, life. And that is the one that we harvest. And therefore we should be careful in doing that. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever thought of uh, how much money comes from uh, uh, the seafood uh, fishery uh, business. Uh, you know, India is estimating to get something like 60,000 crore rupees of uh, annual income from fishing activity from the ocean. But that is maybe small, but uh, more than 3 million people uh, are uh, employed uh, uh, in fishing, and uh, if you look at the uh, the, the shipbuilding, uh, the seagoing uh, cruise, this that, three and a half crore Indians are involved in uh, uh, the marine-related activities. We have uh, when you learn uh, the first, second, and third year students, you will learn what are called coastal environments, estuarine habitats, coral reef, uh, mangrove ecosystems, oceanic realms, and deep sea habitat. India is blessed with all these different uh, ecosystems. And the one uh, line uh, around the green India map you see in the deep blue is our exclusive economic zone, which is about 2.01 million square kilometers. India is uh, 3.2 land uh, million square kilometers plus this 2.01 million square kilometers. If somebody asks you in a GQ, if you go to Kaun Banega Karapati, and if you ask the question, what is the uh, area of India, you should uh, tell them it is 3.2 on the land, 2.01 on the uh, water. So therefore, we have 5 million square kilometers of uh, uh, the, the area, which is a great addition, one third of the uh, our two thirds of the land mass is again coming from there. So the annual fish landings are about 3.5 million tons. It's uh, giving us, as I said, about uh, 10 billion uh, US dollar equivalent. And uh, then there are a lot of problems created by human beings, by uh, greed and catch. The sardine is one of the biggest uh, uh, you know, fishery and that has been suffering a great deal. Ideally, we should be catching somewhere around 150 to 150,000 tons of fish. Look at this. In the, from 1997 onwards, we have been catching until 2014 or 2013 uh, more than 150,000, which meant that we were overfishing. And then, therefore, suddenly in the last three years, the fish has collapsed and you don't get much. Kerala fishermen, 60% of more, close to 2 lakh people are, that is 1.2 lakh Kerala fishermen are dependent on the sardine fishery. Imagine if they don't get this fish, what happens? It's, you see, I can tell you lots of stories because of the time I will not. If the sardine catch is not there, 
the spices that go to fry curry and uh, also make sort of preparation their market also goes down because they are the big consumers there that's how the intertwined economy operates and then the if you allow the fish to breed once there will be better uh, opportunity for uh, saving the stock i just in that one statement i want to close you know the organisms in the ocean suffer from a complex uh, ecosystem <coughs> impacts therefore their life is already at great stress if you go and catch it's extremely difficult for them to cope up uh, the natural pressure and also the fishing pressure therefore just look at the shrimps or the prawns uh, life uh, stage thing you know some many prawn species meet in uh, about 6 to 30 meter deep water they produce floating eggs they hatch in about 15 hours and then there will be about uh, zoea metazoea noplia stage like that 16 stages are there afterwards uh, there comes the uh, the zoea mysis stage which are eaten by other fish that's why i call it easy prey post larva need estuaries that means they have to go inland to the river and mouths to be able to grow and the juveniles move juveniles move back something like uh, after 3 to 4 months unfortunately they are caught therefore what they recruit in one year 90% of the catch is finished in the same year therefore that's really really harsh on them and then they mature in 5 to 6 months so what the prawns are supposed to produce more eggs therefore they they should be allowed to breed once that is what i said in the last slide so marine life is not at all uh, uh, in a safe condition not only we harvest what we catch and eat but also the what is called by catch and trash is much more the trash is often uh, the organisms that may not be eaten by us but they are the important ecological role they play in the ocean decomposing and cleaning up uh, some of the parasites pathogens okay that is all taken away by our fishing uh, methods uh, i think there are solutions which people should be ready in the future the increasing temperature decreasing oxygen and increasing ph uh, decreasing ph that is increasing acidity ocean acidification will be the big problems people have to understand the biology better to be able to serve well and ocean resources are plenty around us i can name a plenty of them and i can come back to uh, tell you each of these uh, resources once again but what my young students should remember is that ocean either its biology or its chemistry geology physics everything has the fundamental science in it and there is an applied science in it there is industrial message in it look at the physics for example the waves tides and thermal gradient energy are the resources to produce renewable energy and then unfortunately the challenges like the bad weather and then to find suitable locations is an issue and then extreme weather and tsunami and earthquake can damage your installations that will be the one the biology you take a microbe and study there are food pigments coming from microbes from the sea you can use them the there are varieties of uh, spirulina for example you have heard all the diatoms and uh, fire, uh, some of those uh, uh, diatoms can be good uh, source of uh, high uh, uh, you know mineral rich uh, nutrients and then therefore also the challenges like climate change will reduce the growth of these organisms and create problems we have always been unmindful exploiting lot of things you know as i told you in the in the 200 nautical miles is about 400 uh, kilometers distance from the coast which means that we cannot guard our ocean many people with advanced fishing uh, fleets can come into our waters and poach that is thieves uh, come and catch our fish and that is bad and there are also some of the algae which form harmful algal blooms that will be killing the fish pollution is a big problem human made should be in this one our primary role should be the conservation of our natural resources okay you see a, a fisherman selling fish and you see the india's economic zone you see a farmer tilling you see the fisherman uh, net uh, operating in the coast you see a big uh, cargo 
ship carrying tank uh, this one what do you call the uh, uh, what boxes are they men ca containers and then you have a lot of uh, port and harbor storage here and ship building activity here look at this these are all the opportunities created by the ocean or by for the economies and the communities and for the land india has about 7500 km long coastline the mainland uh, and uh, then islands uh, are there and there are uh, the sea water is a thing fisheries is another big resource petroleum and minerals and fishing as an occupation shipping ship building ports tourism goa is famous for its tourists and because of the clean beaches hopefully they remain clean i don't know what will be the future with lot of people are not aware of how to keep the beach is clean and therefore we can be creating problem and when the beauty is lost you don't like to go there the agriculture economy is driven by the ocean monsoons and i think i should stop here by showing you this beautiful picture of the earth's life so very beautiful look at this penguin uh, with the chicken chick that is and uh, this is a microscopic uh, picture of uh, a fungal spore from a marine uh, uh, species and uh, within the capsulation are many other zoospores which will be doing the sexual reproduction so this is how life uh, is so beautiful and wonderful i think i should thank you for this thank you with the thought that aap log hindi bhi bol sakte ho isliye do kshan samundar ki samrakshan ke liye bhi socho thank you keep your seas keep our seas clean is a bacterial bioluminescence based uh, a streaking that i did long back this is my message to the world no matter where i have spoken i have shown this and i hope this sensitizes people thank you thank you thank you so much it was a very informative lecture from your side sir and during this presentation uh, also some of the scientist and sir joined like dr mn benugopal sir ex dean college of fisheries mangalore dr uh -huh. shiva kumar sir uh, and other faculty members also joined so i welcome on behalf of college of fisheries i welcome all of you sir and now uh, in this area i would like to go for some uh, quick questions uh, starting Manish, dear students starts thing yeah dear students uh, now you can ask question to uh, sir sir first uh, you unmute yourself okay okay unmute manish sir uh, नमस्कार सर डॉक्टर शिवन गौडा या सर स्पीकिंग फ्रॉम अदानी पावर युअर स्टूडेंट या या इट्स वंडरफुल एक वंडरफुल आई रियली एंजॉयड इट इज कन्नड हेलो बेकंद्र इदु नम ओवरऑल रिपीटेशन आयतो सर द गैस हाइड्रेट्स विल यू प्लीज रिगार्डिंग टेल मी गैस हाइड्रेट्स दैट आई मिस्ड स्लाइड ओके व्हाई यू वांट योर कंपनी टू इन्वेस्ट इन द गैस हाइड्रेट्स Sir, we are in. Uh, I am in actually Mundra and Mandvi area. So it doesn't matter. Are... I am joking. Yeah, it's important. Actually, in Krishna Godavari Basin in the Bay of Bengal, uh, I, I think uh, I want. I don't know. I rush through the slide. There is one joyous re resolution uh, slide. I can go back to that. Manish, slide presentation. Uh, yes, joyous sir. resolution was hired by NIO. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Manish. I'll, I'll just show you that slide for your. I request host to my uh, unmute my uh, video also because I wanted to show my lab. Okay. Yeah, the, Manish, this is in. See, this uh, Jordi's resolution came to Bay of Bengal. To, to make uh, at least uh, about uh, uh, one and a half kilometer deep. I don't want to say exact depth. Uh, deep uh, bore into the uh, Krishna Godavari Basin region, and from there, our scientists, uh, and I was scientists, uh, picked up. Uh, wait, 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 wait. 
Yes, ah, this slide, I think. Yeah, this slide. This slide. Uh, uh, how to minimize that? Yes, how to minimize. See this uh, on the bottom slide. You see, it's about uh, uh, eight inch uh, dia uh, uh, core. It's about a meter in length, and this is uh, found. Uh, I don't want to tell because of its uh, uh, confidentiality. Uh, yes, what sir. kind of a uh, thing it is? As I said. One cubic meter of this uh, uh, block can give out 165 cubic meters of liquefied natural gas, which can be used. You know, our uh, cylinders get only 16 or 15 uh, kg weight. 165 uh, cubic meter can be, I don't know how much it will be. Honestly, um, more than at least 10 cylinders. So this is one, and this is highly, highly important uh, resource. We do not know when it can become uh, economically viable to go and look for it. Now that thanks to Modi ji's government, the solar power production is so high, and uh, then uh, maybe uh, we will do away with uh, the, in the coming years, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, natural, resource-based energy production. And this may take a, a different route. For example, the technology changing to uh, doing any job of, uh, say, um, large-scale uh, um, cooking, uh, which would be, uh, if it is economical, that is, uh, in, uh, in, in places like where the charities are feeding thousands of people, or in emergencies like what happened this year, uh, we can be thinking of uh, those alternatives once this is uh, liquefied. Then. I think the Reliance is also in uh, uh, is doing through ONGC a partnership to uh, kind of prospect from this. And that much I know, Shivana. So thank you so much, sir. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, good. Thank I, you, would, I would like you to get back to me on uh, uh, my. Yeah, we have also established a very good lab. So okay. yeah. I, uh, ah, oh, oh, there you are. We okay. have a uh, good Fantastic. So, as an NIO student, I uh, know I continued uh, NIO culture over here. Wonderful, wonderful. Nice to see this. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. You thank the organizers to let you do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Okay. My students, at least they will be aware about it, sir. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Yes. Yeah. Virtual, virtual tour to virtual tour, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now I request uh, our students also uh, to yeah, participate. Sure. Yeah, please, dear students. You can ask. Sir, it was a wonderful pr presentation. Hello, sir. Yeah, yeah Doctor Prabhjiti. Yeah, please. It was a wonderful presentation, sir. Thank you so much. We are blessed and we are enriched, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. I mean, anyway, I'm glad it went well. Sorry for the hitch in the connect connectivity. No, no, it happens, no, 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 it's no, it's no not. It's not. We but, had this uh, problem. Finally, Mary Patni ne mujhe help ki ki uska phone ka net data dene ke baad hi smooth ho gaya. Dekho, sir. <laughs> sir, behind every successful man, there is a woman always. Sir. Uh, see, behind this successful presentation, my wife, uh, <laughs> yes, sir. My wife's uh, digital data. Oh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. Students, yes. particularly third year students, you have this course. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. So yes. you can ask. I'll be too delighted to answer yeah, anything yeah. that I There are some question in chat box, sir. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do I open the chat box, Manish? No, no, uh, okay. Doctor, Doctor Jitender will ask that on behalf okay. of the students. Yes, yeah. The, the different method for preservation for phytoplankton. Yeah. Sir. Like, very good, very good. Yeah. Thank you. See, Doctor Jitendra, I was uh, really running through because of this overall advance. Uh, you gave a title for me to talk on advances in ocean agriculture. <laughs> so advances will not touch on methods much. Even then. I'll, I'm glad to answer. I'm very happy the students uh, are interested in understanding that. What we do, there is a thing called Lugol's iodine, if they have a ton of it. And then we can buffer the Lugol's iodine of about 1% in 3% uh, buffered formalin and very little to be added. Say for about 500 ml, uh, we collect the water sample directly from a Niskin bottle or Nansen's bottle. 
and put it into a 500 ml plastic uh, polythene uh, bottle and into which uh, the lugols are added in 10% concentration, two, three drops are added so that, uh, and then into which about 3% of uh, two ml, uh, two, three ml, depending on, uh, uh, you know, if, if you or she is not taking, the formalin is for a fixation. This uh, is the mordant, the iodine is a mordant, which will be giving the firmness to the uh, skeleton of the phytoplankton. That's how the Lugol iodine is uh, added to, to the uh, preservation. And yes. Another question is ask uh, what is the role of the remote sensing where the ocean biology can be easily understandable? Wonderful. Uh, the remote sensing is satellite oceanography. So we have, uh, I, I, I must tell you here, uh, thanks, uh, thanks to the student for this question. You know, earlier, CWIFS was the satellite uh, back in 1978, they put wide field survey, WIFS, C, wide field, wide field survey was the uh, satellite that was uh, sent out. And they collected the data of the surface chlorophyll, mostly based on the uh, spectrum, uh, spectrophotometric characteristic or the radiometric characteristic of the ocean reflectance. The, the chlorophyll was filtered through an array of uh, the nanometer uh, bandwidth uh, they choose to screen out the intensity of the strength mm -hmm. that comes based on which they will be saying higher the, uh, say, absorption at 543 nanometer that exclusively comes from chlorophyll A, and therefore that is put into uh, saying that this is the strength, therefore this is the concentration in a given region. Now, this remote sensing is uh, looking the large area from a single eye, and when you have an angular uh, distribution, you get a wide swath of uh, the, the, the area. Say, if your uh, satellite is 36,000 kilometers uh, or so on top, from there, you beam it up, the entire Earth is seen in one go. And whereas there are uh, the, the physical oceanographers and these remote sensing guys are very smart. They can enlarge from the micro space to the macro space they want. And from there, they really get a huge quantity of analysis done for a thing. So what I want to say is remote sensing is about the satellite oceanography based study and the chlorophyll pigment concentration is done. And for developing uh, uh, the CVF story is over. I want to tell the most important message to the world that ocean color monitoring, OCM, a satellite was introduced in 2002 or a little later in uh, by India. The Indian satellite image is 100,000 better picture than the previous one, no matter what. Therefore, India's satellite technology, technology is among the best in the world and we could get such a clear picture of the, uh, the chlorophyll imaging. It's not only chlorophyll, sea surface height, sea waves, a sudden tsunami uh, progression, and then uh, how the tsunami damages happen. What is the coastal extent of uh, erosion? What is the coastal damage that happens during a cyclone? These are hundreds of applications that comes from the ocean uh, analysis by the remote sensing. So this is how uh, they do it. And one other important point that was rushing in my mind was the National Remote Sensing Agency in Hyderabad are doing commendable job in terms of uh, analyzing the ocean color uh, data to say uh, what could be the future pro production. Say this monsoon is over. The fishing season is also almost over. By July, August and September, they would predict uh, the chlorophyll pigment concentration for the year that is up to December now. And therefore, people can understand, the policymaker can get an in input, like how, how good is the fish catch that can be possible. The fish catch is not happening to the tune that was happening previously because we have large number of boats that are coming and catching. 
not to divert you uh, jitendra your look is uh, for a different question so <laughs> in in essence remote sensing has helped but it can it has lot of limitations it cannot go to deeper than 10 meters and say what is the see the chlorophyll funnily the maximum of it is sitting in the deep chlorophyll maxima we say i showed a uh, what is called mixed layer depth no somewhere between that depth of uh, 25 to 30 meter in the arabian sea is the maximum chlorophyll concentration that is missed by the remote sensing <laughs> so one yeah. more one more last question we will take so yes. like this uh, the pelagic fishery the production data the prediction data how it is helpful for demersal fishery very good see this uh, you must understand the benthic production is also very high and uh, uh, why it is high is because of the organic matter that settles in is uh, worked on uh, by the bacteria so much that there is also the other uh, the, the the food is eaten by small benthic organisms they are eaten again by the demersal fish in that most of them are carnivores in nature the uh, the uh, the benthic form uh, benthic or demersal fishes so therefore there is the not a direct relationship but it will be much less than the pelagic the pelagic fish is mostly school forming ones the demersal fish is mostly shoal the small sized uh, thing say bombay duck uh, is a demersal fish that will be going through in one uh, particular stream of current uh, and it has a one uh, group of uh, fishes that can be uh, supported because the food is a limitation the benthic capture is much less compared to what happens on the pelagic uh, realm Okay. okay so thank you so much sir okay. we have so many question we will uh, get back to you, uh, students and participants uh, uh, we will be updating you the details so we are running shortage of time sir yeah okay uh, one small thing i want to ask sir what are the career opportunities in this field uh, for our students can you uh, yes please? thank you i mean in between i was trying to tell them see the if uh, your students are interested in doing uh, microscopic work there is phytoplankton zooplankton bacteria and viruses is also becoming very important now if they are interested in modeling the mathematically strong background wale logon ko they can think of opting for uh, say computer uh, based uh, uh, model uh, you know prediction models if they are good uh, in chemistry the pollution analysis sea water quality analysis and then also trace gases is the most important uh, new field that is developing say the methane there are many many uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, you know uh, dms we call the dimethyl sulfide pro dmsp uh, i mean there is a lot of uh, those things chemistry can do the physics the light measurement in the ocean is a great thing then the people there an i worked on bioluminescent bacteria now the bioluminescence is becoming an important application in uh, oh naval applications and uh, then it is just not in ocean institutions the fisheries the uh, banking sector uh, where the uh, boats and other things are uh, being uh, uh, financed uh, the net uh, making uh, sector and there is endless opportunity fisheries is one of the most encompassed and beautifully professionally preparing uh, course and people should keep their mind open and my dear students keep your passion ready if you have chosen to be a fisheries graduate please contribute your worth you, you there is no no job which is great there is no job which is small the smallest contribution also counts a great deal in developing some other you know it will open up windows and opportunities for some other uh, uh, fields so therefore don't shy that i am not good and things like that be be passionate be committed be sincere this will help you a great deal hello sir uh, uh, sir one small question dr prabhjit here sir yes sir sir one small question is that like if some of our student in future like phd student 
of FRM department, he wants to, we want him to work on certain oceanic parameters. So is it possible that we can take a collaborative research with uh, NIO or we need to have a memorandum first or something like that? Or we can just take one scientist guide from that institute in our committee? What's the procedure, sir? Yes, sir. See, uh, Prabhjit ji, you, you are a yes, person who has seen the world. And collaboration yes, comes from give and take. Like and I said, in oceans, it's only give and take. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You drop an email to me uh, with that request, and then you can uh, give this background. I'll forward it to the people in NIO that I know, and also the director. The, the current director uh, uh, joined after I retired, and I have uh, really less contact with him, but he's a nice person, I've heard. So we can always be yes. making a link. It's always better to have an institutional mechanism for uh, any of this because you're coming from a long distance and it's important that people get to understand. You're not very far from, uh, say, Indus mouth if you want to do some measurement measurements and things like that. People should, uh, they, you know, I'm sitting in the center of uh, Karnataka, not, I never had seen a ocean before. And uh, just because I have not seen the ocean, I need not be... I uh, should not be an oceanographer. So people can pick up and do their uh, interest. Right, sir. Thank you. Right. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Thank you drop me that uh, mail. I'll okay, sir. Yeah. 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 Uh, Dr. Jitendra Kumar has my email address. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sir. Any other question uh, from faculty also, please? Um, if not, then... Any student want to interact personally? Uh, also? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the email number, email ID and phone number is also with us. Yes. And then if not any other question, then uh, I request Dr. Jitender for formal vote of thanks. Wow, look at this, my picture. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Dr. Jitendra, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, 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 th thank you once again. Uh, uh, good morning to once again to all the participant. And uh, first of all, I thanks to Almighty God for the making this function as a great success. And uh, I'm really thank you for uh, giving chance to extend my vote of thanks on behalf of the Rwangadde Veterinary Animal. Science University College of Fisheries, Lodihana, sir. We express our uh, sincere thanks to Dr. Ramayas Answer, is uh, the former head and chief scientist department of biological oceanography, the CSIR and IO Goa, on enlightening us on advances in oceanography and uh, marine biology. And uh, the, today's webinar was uh, full of knowledge and uh, inspiring things, and uh, it gave a uh, very interesting and relevant. Uh, uh, information for uh, interesting facts and the NIO that uh, the slogan it is very very like uh, lighting the understanding the sea and uh, today sir was pointed about like different layers of the oceans which is uh, will be very useful for the our BFSC graduate and uh, is also pointed out like India having the seventh position in the oceanography in the world which is very proud moment for our Indians as well as he has pointed out the, the importance of the phytoplankton, synoptic view of the chlorophyll, that was a very interesting fact, the significance of the zooplankton, and uh, the interesting about the sardine landing, where is the, uh, it was a very interesting, uh, the graph. And uh, he also pointed out the different uh, areas where having the opportunity for more research. I'm pretty sure that the precious information, the knowledge that you have gave us, sir, will definitely help our students. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us for uh, with us, with your inspiring and motivational word. We have a lot to learn from you, sir. Once again, I would like thanks to Dr. Ramaya and sir for taking our time for his busy schedules and enlightening us with the knowledge. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh See, is that uh, fair to say that Satsri Akal to me? <laughs> yes, Satsri Akal. 
Yes, thank you. Are. Thank you. Uh, all of you and all the very best uh, in your future endeavor. I, I wish that uh, you guys uh, uh, do some outstanding work and contribute to the growth of fisheries in the country. And I you are part sir, of the world. Sir, 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 anybody can say Satriyaka. Let me tell you the meaning. Sir, uh, yeah, Satriyaka means God is truth. God is truth. No, no. In the sense, is it the right time? Like, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can. Sir, this this greeting can be used anytime. Anytime. Thanks a lot, uh, Prabhjit ji. Very nice Thank meeting you. you. God bless you. May you have Thank a very you, successful college there. Okay, Thank just you. I'll complete it with an one red. I would also like to uh, respect our honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Indrajit Singh, sir, Dean College of Fish, uh, Fisheries, Dr. Meera D. Ansel, madam, Dean College of Veterinary Science, Dr. SPS Gumman, sir, and Dr. Vinit Indar Kaur, madam, is College of Fisheries IDP coordinator for giving permission to organize this webinar and also providing fund from ICR IDP National Agriculture Higher Education Project which helped to conduct this webinar. I would also like thanks to organizing secretary, Dr. S. N. Datta sir, for providing a platform where we, we interacted. And also I'm very much thankful to Ms. Amandeep Kaur, madam, for uh, making all the arrangement from the initiation to till now for making event this successful. Finally, I thank to all the participants, my students, my colleagues, and respected dignitaries who joined during the session, who present here for paying attention for, and spending time, valuable time with us. I would end my speech here by thanking once again all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jitendra, thank you, for your thank nice Thank you work. so much. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. thanks. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless Namaste. you all. Namaste. Thank Just you. I want to say one uh, skin, sir. When I was uh, with you, sir. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have saved. I am not good in keeping the history, uh -huh. but uh, I'm 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 glad that uh, you uh, shared this and uh, uh -huh. Doctor, you reconnected. Dr. Dr. You and, can uh, send this picture to sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, there you are. Thanks. And so this is this Thank is you. actually we took our we used to take our students for. Uh, ah our, yes, Kochi. Uh, Kochi, we used to, every year we used to take there, sir. Last year, we, uh, I took students and we, it was a very grateful session, sir. The good, that, that I think, doctor, uh, our uh, uh, presently, that uh, time it was, Dinesh Kumar was in charge. Yeah, yeah. Sir. yeah. I hope you met him. They are very good people. And yeah. I guys are really nice. Very nice, sir, it was. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'll close my screen. Yeah, okay, please. sir. Yeah, thank please. You.